I have spoken before about the movie The Lion King, based not so secretly upon the Shakespeare play Hamlet, though a lot more joyous. It's a film that at its heart is about identity and belonging. Simba, our hero and protagonist, knows who he is as the movie begins. He is the son of Mufasa, the one who will be king, and he'll happily tell you all about it. Just ask. In fact, there's a whole song about Simba thinking about becoming king. But the death, really the murder, of his father and some crafty mental manipulation by his uncle's star leave him adrift, wondering who he is and where he belongs. Fortunately for us, and because otherwise it would be a short movie, Simba meets two new friends who give him a temporary place to belong. But as the movie comes to its climax, Simba is reminded that that indeed was a temporary place. He's reminded who he is and where he belongs. He is the king and belongs with his pride back in the pride lands with his family. It's a movie about belonging, about knowing who you are. And Simba is finally successful when the movie comes to a joyous end when he finally finds his place of belonging in the circle of life. Our epistle this morning, too, is about belonging, about knowing our place. It comes near the end of Paul's letter to the church in Rome, a letter where he is introducing himself by writing the longest and most complete look at his theology found in our Bibles. Most of Paul's letters are written to churches he has founded, churches that already know him and have heard him preach, that know how he thinks, and so their direct responses to problems they're having as Paul tries to wrestle with them what it means to be the church. But Romans is instead a response to a trip Paul hopes to take, to a church that's already been founded that Paul hopes to visit and share with. And so Paul feels the need to give a broad picture of his theology going this way and that way, different pieces of who he is. And by this point in the book of Romans, this broad look has included words about grace and forgiveness, a glimpse of Paul's Christology and what he thinks about the cross, and even a passage we read a few weeks ago, asserting that nothing can separate us from God's love. And Paul begins to bring this letter and his theology to a close by giving us a powerful and amazing statement, a statement that is to say succinctly, good news, that is gospel. And it's this, so then, whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. When we are alive, we are claimed by our Creator, loved and cared for, no matter how many times we mess up or how much sin comes into our lives. We belong to the Lord. And in our deaths, for all of us who die at some point, we are claimed by our Creator, claimed by the one who has promised that death is not the last word, claimed by the one who offers us new and everlasting life in Jesus Christ, claimed by our God whose love is so strong that not even death can separate us from it. In all of this, too, we are the Lord's. It is, I said, a powerful statement, one that to me lies at the heart of this thing we call faith. In seminary, one of the questions we are taught to reflect upon and preach upon is this, who and whose are we? And this passage from Romans gives us an answer. We belong to God. Whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. That's whose we are. And who we are is similar. We are the children of God, claimed and loved by our Creator. That's who and whose we are. And I can think of no greater news or stronger words of hope. 
And nothing can change this. Let's make sure we emphasize that point. You know, many of us are parents. And one of the realities of parenting is nothing keeps us from loving our children. They can mess up. They can be estranged from us, even. And we still love them. We still wish they were in our lives. They can not clean their room. But younger, younger, younger kids now. Um, they can have attitudes in the morning. But nothing can stop us from loving them. And that's true for God as well. Nothing, nothing can change this statement. Whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. I could stop preaching right now, because that's a good chunk of gospel. Except for one thing. This morning's gospel passage. I will admit, I spent some time grappling with what passage to read and use as a sermon, the book, the passage of Romans, or the Gospel of Matthew. But then I realized something. The two of them are complementary. They give each other deeper meaning and help us understand the other better. In the Gospel, Peter asks Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Perhaps hoping for a small number that he could count on his fingers and then, bang, stay angry. But Jesus, as he does so many times, disappoints. Not seven times, he says, but seventy-seven times. Some translations say seven times, seven times, or seventy times, seven times. But as one of the resources said this week, if you're arguing the presence of the zero or exactly how many numbers Jesus actually meant, you're missing the whole point. The idea is to be a number beyond counting. One we can't keep track of. We're not supposed to keep a tally mark until we get to a certain number, and then, ha, we don't have to forgive anymore. Instead, we are to be a people of forgiveness, who, like our God, are slow to anger and quick to forgive. We're not to hold grudges or hold on to anger. We're to forgive when we are wronged. And that forgiveness happens even before the asking. We don't, aren't told to wait until someone says, hey, I'm sorry to forgive. We simply offer it. Because it's for us. And forgiveness doesn't mean there's no consequences in life. But our souls are to let go of anger and bitterness and hurt and forgive. Because that's who we're called to be. Forgive whether it's a small thing or even a big thing. Even a thing as big as 10,000 talents, as in the parable this morning. A talent, by the way, is about one day's wages. The first slave owed 10,000 days wages in debt. In other words, a number too big to count. We're to forgive even things that big. Because as people of God, people who follow Jesus, forgiveness and grace is to be a way of life. And that's what it looks like when we live out the identity of who and whose we are. When we truly begin to believe that we are God's and that God loves us and claims us. And we live out that claim in the world. Romans tells us that whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. And as people who belong to the Lord, we are called to forgive. That's what that claim looks like in action. When we forgive, we are showing we belong to the Lord. We're saying, yes, this is true, and I'll live it out. That's what it looks like live out the call and the response and the gift of God's love for us to share that love and 
grace and forgiveness the whole world. Conversely, it is that very love and that very claim that God places upon us that makes forgiveness possible in the first place. Because make no mistake, forgiveness is hard work. It's in many ways human nature to, when we are hurt, to hold on to the hurt, or what retribution, or to make them pay, or to get back at them. It's not good for our souls, but it's human nature. The forgiveness that Christ hopes for us, dreams for us, and calls us to is different than what we want to naturally do. And we can only do it because we are empowered by the forgiveness and grace of God that meets us where we are. By the claim of God that says to us, you are mine and I love you and I forgive you. It is that love and that claim that allows us to forgive others. It is that love and that claim that allows us to live it out in ways we otherwise could not Whose are we? We are God's. Because whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. And who are we? We are the children of God, claimed and loved by our Creator, who are called to live a life steeped in forgiveness. That's who we are. That's our place. That's our role in the circle of humanity to which we all belong. We are to be a people of forgiveness because that forgiveness points back to the one who claims all of us, our very creator, because we too have been forgiven. Like Simba, we can have struggles at times remembering this claim upon us. That's actually another human characteristic. And like, well, everyone, we need reminders from time to time of who and whose we are. Reminders of our call to forgive, and that's sort of what we've got in the church. But whether we're getting it all right, 100%, Forgiving a loving just as Christ wants us to, or whether we're messing up big time or more likely somewhere in between. The simple truth remains this, friends. Whether we live or whether we die, we belong to and are loved by the Lord. Thanks be to God.